Welcome everyone. I'm State Representative Nika Alugardo and I represent parts of Jamaica Plain and Rosendale and Mission Hill in Boston, as well as part of the town of Brookline. And it is my great honor today to join the PCOS Challenge team to talk about why we want to make September in Massachusetts PCOS Awareness Month. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a condition that affects many women and many women live in silence. However, women of color uh, are disproportionately impacted. It not only impacts fertility, but it also increases the chances of uh, contracting a wide range of uh, very challenging illnesses. And when we detect PCOS early, women can not only live healthier lives, but they can actually prevent very serious illnesses from ever coming to pass. Now, like many issues of public health equity and race equity, we're not only talking about the uh, symptoms here. We're also talking about the life experience and wellness and the quality of life of young women who are misunderstood, misdiagnosed, uh, incorrectly um, uh, guided, given bad guidance, dangerous guidance, uh, and harmful guidance that negatively impacts not only their physical health, but also their mental health in ways that can carry with them for the rest of their lives. And this is a struggle of women worldwide. However, the good news is when we do something about it, the direct opposite happens. Women are able to take charge of their health, physical and mental health. They're able to uh, live thriving and healthy lives, and they're able to help and support other women in doing so. PCOS for me is personal and it's policy. It's personal because my daughter, Consuela Mansour, who's with us today, she was diagnosed with PCOS. And when she told me about it, I didn't know what it was. And I didn't really understand what she was going through. I knew it had something to do with whether or not it would be maybe potentially more difficult for her to have children. And it had something to do with weight gain. And I thought, okay, those are things we can just roll with. But it took me quite some time to understand the depth of what my own daughter was going through. Uh, because it's more than just getting a couple of pieces of news about whether or not your family planning is gonna be different than you expected. It's a whole lifestyle change that's required. And there are lifestyle changes that family members can support, friends can support, but also that government and the public sector can support. And that's by making sure that not only the medical community, but all communities understand this issue, understand PCOS, but also understand that the dark and deep disparities that are longstanding between uh, the healthcare and healthcare access that people of color receive and other people receive, that women receive versus men receiving, and that all genders of people whose uh, experience with their own bodies is underrepresented and misunderstood uh, struggle in ways that we can never understand if we haven't been through it. So many of us have been through it in different ways and our courageous PCOS women are here to encourage us, but also to educate us on what we can do differently going forward. I'm very excited about the lineup that we have today, but I have to say that Delegate Price from Virginia, who I met recently, is uh, somebody that even though she's, I think, significantly younger than me, I want to be when I grow up. And so I hope you'll be on to be able to hear her comments as well, following a number of other speakers. But she's not only inspiring as a PCOS survivor, if I may say, <laughs> uh, and it's not PCOS that's as big of a problem as the world's response to it. Uh, she's not only a leader in that area, but she's a leader in equity and justice across the board. She's bold, she's beautiful, she's, uh, She's as sharp as can be. And she's exactly the, the type of person that makes me believe in our democracy and in the future of our country. And so I'm really happy to have her. But I'd like to introduce my daughter, 
who uh, many of you have not met Consuela, but I, I know that I have a mother's bias, but I can tell you I've been told many times that my daughter is a very special woman, but what I can tell you is that she was born that way. She has a passionate heart for others. And even when she was two years old, she was asking me questions about why people were living on the street, what we can do about it. Uh, and so Consuela has always thought more broadly than herself. And so when she has something that she struggles with, very often um, it's difficult, I think, for, for us, for all of us to recognize that she has needs too because she's such a giver, because she's so generous. And this is one of the challenges that I think many women of color have with the healthcare system. We're perceived as strong, we're perceived as resilient, we're perceived as not needing much, we're perceived as being there for others. And I am guilty of seeing my daughter in that way. And I'm grateful to her and to the PCOS team for helping me to remember that she needs care, her story needs to be heard. And I'm so grateful for her courage and her vulnerability, which is a kind of strength that is very, very special, especially in political spheres, to come before these offices today. And thank you all for being with us and sharing and tell her story so we can begin to learn what we can do differently. I will also say, just when I sent out an email this morning, a number of my colleagues replied to say, I'm signing onto the bill. Uh, I have a sister, I have a wife, um, or I didn't know. And so Consuela and Delegate Price and PCOS Challenge team, uh, you've already done great work. I also wanna give thanks to Senator Warren who will hear a video presentation from for her leadership here. But Consuela, you're not only the love of my heart, but you're one of the women that I admire most in the world from your social work with young women and babies in the community to the loving, uh, to the loving challenges that you give to me as your mom to help me be the best that I can be. I'm so glad to share this moment with you and with my colleagues. Take it away, kiddo. Thank you so much for having me and thank you mom for that beautiful intro. Um, I'm just super thankful to be here and for the opportunity to share my story with you guys and just have people who are willing to listen. I think that's sometimes rare in our community. So I'm super thankful that you're all here and. Um, for all the partners and people that I'm meeting just through um, this meeting and learning about PCOS Challenge has been really exciting as well. So I'm just excited to hear from everyone else too. Um, but I'll start with sharing a bit of my story. So I was diagnosed with PCOS in 2017, um, right when I had turned 22, like around that time. Um, I had also just gotten engaged maybe two or three weeks before. So when I first got PCOS, I was told by the doctor, um, you could have trouble having kids, you might have diabetes, you should lose some weight so that you don't have diabetes soon. And um, I'm gonna put you on birth control so that that can manage some of the symptoms. And I remember I was so confused and so scared. Um, I called my then fiance and started crying. And I was like, what if we can never have kids? Like all of these fears just started rolling in of, I didn't know what my life was gonna look like from there on forward. and. I had some plans of, you know, children in the future and um, we were getting married soon. And so there's that pressure too of like, I want to lose the weight for the wedding and all these things. So it was just a lot of um, stress that came with that diagnosis and um, confusion because I didn't really fully understand what it meant. There was one nurse that I'll give props to who told me, um, don't worry, I've seen a lot of women have kids with PCOS. So I was like, okay, that made me feel a little bit better, but for the most part, there was a lot of fear um, in that diagnosis. And um, I was thankful for my fiance being super supportive, saying, you know, we'll get when we get there, we can deal with that. Um, we're not even thinking about it now. Don't worry, let's just plan the wedding, we'll be all right. So that was helpful, but also still I just didn't have that much information about PCOS. Um, so I did, and that also led me to go to counseling in that period of time for the first time. Um, that I had at that point in my life um, regularly, because uh, we, you know, planning the wedding, I had just graduated, I moved out of my parents' home, all these different things were going on that um, that mental health piece was also really helpful for me to kind of manage 
this new information at the beginning. Um, so from there, I did some research on my own. I learned a lot about nutrition and exercise and how that affects PCOS and how it can be different for women with PCOS than other people, um, what's best for your body. I learned what sugar can do to my body and what insulin resistance is and um, all these different science, pro what proteins are doing in our body and hormones and all this stuff that was a little bit over my head and confusing, but I did, I feel like I learned a lot and I was able to manage it for a bit in preparation for our wedding. And I actually lost a lot of weight and I was feeling really good. And then after we got married, I think um, I started to develop more symptoms than I had in the past of like facial hair, gaining 10 pounds each year and like other fatigue and low energy levels and things that I didn't even know were connected to PCOS necessarily. Um, and so I started doing research again and trying to understand even more deeply. I tried talking to my doctors, but they didn't always know the connection to PCOS and these different um, symptoms that I was having. And so I started to feel pretty embarrassed sometimes of like the weight gain. And I felt like people were like, but you just lost a bunch of weight for your wedding. Like, what's going on? And so I think I, you know, you start to, to feel kind of alone in that of like, I'm trying, I'm eating healthy, but I'm not getting the results that people expect. And so that was like kind of heavy to hold. And um, when my mom asked me, maybe earlier this year, if it was okay, if she shared that I had PCOS with people, I was kind of uh, nervous about that and not really sure if I wanted her to do that because I was like, I can't even fully understand what's going on with me and I don't know how to explain it to someone. So if somebody asks me, what am I gonna say? If somebody, um, like they're gonna think I can't have kids and now people are asking when are you gonna have kids and I don't even know. So it's like, a, it was a lot to think about sharing that with anyone outside of our family at that time and a couple best friends. Um, so I didn't really have anyone that I was talking to about it. Um, but then I found some different groups online that I joined and found a lot of like a PCOS community um, kind of virtually actually and ended up paying for some programs, which I'll mention later, but it's it can be a very expensive diagnosis to learn about I've found. Um, and so, yeah, it was, so this, the past, I would say year or so has been a lot of learning and um, growing in my understanding of PCOS and how it's affecting me personally and how that can be different than how it affects other people too. Um, and so I, yeah, I guess a few takeaways from that have been, I learned a lot about nutrition, but I've also realized that the things that are recommended for women with PCOS to eat are often more expensive. And so I'm thankful that I've been able to manage that and, and buy some of the things that are helpful for me. But I know that for a lot, most women, I would say, that's a very difficult aspect of having this diagnosis. And I think also um, even just getting the information from these other women who have researched PCOS and joining these groups that you pay to join and learn from, it's been an expensive um, journey. And also feeling like there's not enough research, like my doctors are very nice, but sometimes they don't know the answer to my questions and, um, or they suggest things that actually aren't helpful. Like for example, cardio to lose weight isn't always the best thing for, for women with PCOS. And so I, I, I've had a challenge when, when reaching out to doctors and trying to get the different blood tests or whatever that I would like to help understand my body. Um, I have to kind of finagle my way through to get that information from them, which has been um, difficult. And I think if we could eventually help with more research being done, that would be wonderful. Um, and then another piece too has just been how stress affects um, PCOS. And I think that um, I've learned a lot about sleep and how that can benefit my mental health, but my physical health as well and managing stress. And I just think about a lot of the women that I work with or the people, friends that I interact with, people who struggle with chronic stress just because of their situation, poverty, family, loss, whatever it may be, but having stress that you're consistently holding along with a PCOS diagnosis could be like very 
devastating for some women. And I think we need to figure out a way to support people who are dealing with deep stress and PCOS um, as well. Um, yeah, and I think that raising this awareness is important and solidifying this awareness month. Um, for me, I think the biggest reason would be so that women and girls just don't feel so alone because I think you're going through this and you're confused, you feel kind of powerless and you don't think that there's anyone that really understands what's going on with you. And if you see like, oh, my state understands or wants to understand at least what's going on with me, now I can ask questions. Now I can find people in this community who are ready to help and um, provide for me just that emotional support, but also the education that I need. Um, and I think we would all feel empowered to, to do things like this and to, to talk about our stories because we know there are other people who have gone through similar things. Um, so yeah, I think it will lead to increased education, increased research, and just a feeling of empowerment for, for all of us with PCOS. So thank you for listening and I'm excited to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you so much, Consuela, for um, being open to share your story. I, you know, this month um, we've, our theme has been break the silence around PCOS and you're doing just that by sharing your story and um, helping to raise the profile of PCOS and um, working with your mom to do just that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Shruti Malingaya. Um, Dr. Shruti will be uh, speaking about doing an overview of PCOS. And uh, so Dr. Shruti, if you could just uh, introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, my name is Shruti Mahalingaya. I am a reproductive endocrinology and infertility doc. I'm currently at Mass General, but spent over uh, around a decade at Boston Medical Center. And I have a research lab at um, Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health, trying to understand the role of environmental factors in reproductive health, as well as polycystic ovary syndrome. I'm honored to be here today. Consuela, thank you so much for your story. Um, and I will bring a clinical perspective to this conversation on why it's so important for us to take polycystic ovary syndrome seriously. I just wanted to give um, a high level overview of um, a um, patient scenario, a, a common scenario of a person that might come into clinic. And here we have someone who's 27 years old who came in um, over concern of irregular periods and excessive um, facial hair growth. And this person might bring in their menstrual record if they have one or just know that their history um, is notable for unpredictable periods. And sometimes that bleeding pattern is very heavy and irregular, unpredictable, hard to plan. Um, sometimes um, there might be spotting. And um, this person complained um, about hair growth on the face and clinically we can use um, different scales to determine the severity of that um, hair growth, which are terminal coarse hairs all around the body, um, but most concerning, particularly around exposed skin. Um, so you can see kind of severity of uh, manifestations of that hair on the um, upper lip, chin, um, upper chest are, are a few of the body areas. Um, this person mentioned that um, she had undergone a menarche, which is the first period later on in life, and her periods had never been let regular. Um, she also shared she had not been pregnant before and never um, received hormonal uh, therapy for menstrual management. Um, most concerning to her was a new diagnosis of hypertension in the setting of her regular periods, which actually inspired her to come in and seek some further diagnosis, evaluation, and management. And um, I did talk a little bit about family history uh, to understand were there any risk factors with her family. And for her, in this scenario, there wasn't, but in some families there are um, familial risk. Um, I wanted to paint a big picture um, in understanding what are ovulation disorders, and um, these are the World Health Organization categories of ovulation disorders. 
Um, in order to understand ovulation and menstruation health, I just will give a little bit of an um, overview that this requires a communication between the hypothalamus and the brain, um, the anterior pituitary secreting reproductive hormones, communicating with the ovaries and um, with response from the uterus at the level of the endometrium to create and respond to those hormones with regular cyclic periods. Polycystic ovary syndrome is one of the most common ovulation disorders um, and fits into category two in the teal box here. And um, this, this is the most common, although you might not have heard of it, you might may have heard of hypothalamic amenorrhea or no periods, irregular periods due to overexercising, being undernourished, which is uh, approximately 10% of all ovulation disorders or um, an ovulation disorder called premature uh, menopause or ovarian in insufficiency, which is also around 5%. But PCOS is within that category of 85% of ovulation um, disorders. It's very important and affects a lot of women with ovulation disorders. The um, prevalence of PCOS in early studies in the 1990s was thought to be a little lower, six and a half to eight percent. And these were studies from island communities like an island off of Greece. Um, it's as high as 15 to 20 percent. And in current studies, population based studies, there is a concern that maybe um, the prevalence is increasing or we are getting a little uh, better able at diagnosing the condition. Um, risk factors include uh, family history as well as uh, increased recent weight. The diagnostic criteria for PCOS um, includes um, a history, physical exam, and a blood uh, and uh, blood-based laboratory evaluation, and sometimes radiologic tests, which in, with an ultrasound, either transabdominally or transvaginally. Um, the criteria include the history component of irregular periods, the history component of um, report of extra of androgenic symptoms, which are extrafacial body hair, acne, and um, hair loss at the level of the scalp. Um, and then if that doesn't exist, uh, patients can have elevated androgens or testosterone and other kinds of um, androgens in the blood. So not everyone has the typical androgenic clinical symptoms. And then finally, that ultrasound um, test, which can help us understand whether the ovaries have a typical look of polycystic ovaries, which is shown in the image, um, also called string of pearls appearance, where um, this um, shows the arrested follicles, which are synonymous for cysts, um, where ovulation is hard to, uh, challenging to happen in that ovary. There is a major health impact in women with polycystic ovary syndrome that impact all aspects of health. And we heard a little bit about this from Consuelo, including metabolic syndrome to include diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, fertility issues, as well as whole body health, um, which I'll share with you a little more. Most concerning um, to many of the women I see are the impacts on future fertility, the risk of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer, and overall quality of life. This summarizes health impacts across the lifespan, and there is a huge burden of costs that women and people with PCOS have to um, kind of have that burden. And in 2005 dollars, this is approximately four and a half billion dollars, um, including medications, additional therapies, hair removal, which is not covered by insurance. Um, the burden of disease is vast. I mentioned how this can affect across the lifespan. There is a disparity as well in risk acceleration among women and people of color um, for developing at an earlier age metabolic complications from this disorder. So it's something that we need to address not only in the clinic, but at the level of the population. Um, there are risks not only across the lifespan, but in gestation and during pregnancy, mothers with PCOS can have a higher risk of preeclampsia, um, preterm birth, and a smaller um, size of the baby. Um, and there is early studies, there's not a lot of data yet, but there is some concern that uh, mothers with PCOS have um, children, regardless of gender, with a higher risk for metabolic syndrome. And we don't know enough about what we can do to mitigate that risk or reduce that risk um, at this time. There are multiple goals in managing 
PCOS clinically um, from preventing endometrial cancer to um, addressing the androgenic symptoms if patients have them to keeping that uterus healthy and helping with planning and uh, regulating the menstrual um, cycles to um, whole body effects of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. This disease can affect other organ systems like the liver, the pancreas. It's associated with sleep apnea, mental health um, conditions, and infertility. In conclusion, um, I'd like to emphasize that PCOS is a serious health condition that impacts overall health for the majority of women with irregular periods or an ovulation disorder, and we need to take it seriously. Raising awareness of PCOS can help with early detection and diagnosis and can facilitate management and risk reduction across the lifespan for people with PCOS, um, ideally across our world, but I'd like to thank everyone um, listening today. And I'm gonna turn it back to Sasha for potential for questions or we can hold till the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Malangaya, for sharing a little bit more about PCOS. I know it's um, just hearing the name PCOS, most people wouldn't understand just how um, widespread, how far reaching the disorder is. Um, so thank you for giving us that overview. And so I'd like to, we can uh, do Q&A at the end. Um, I'd like to give a, brief introduction um, about why this bill means so much to us as an organization, PCOS Challenge, and also um, mention our partnership with Resolve New England. Resolve New England, um, they, uh, Kate, say hi Kate, um, they are, they're, we're working together in partnership on this bill and um, our, our boots on the ground in Massachusetts. And um, we're very, very excited and um, to have you working, to be working with you. Um, Kate is really energetic and, um, and was the first person to reach out to Rep Nika. And <laughs> so we're so grateful for your work. Um, and so I just wanted to, a little bit about me. I am, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovary syndrome, which is where PCOS Challenge was born. It was born out of my own frustrations with um, trying to find resources and um, uh, even evidence-based information. Uh, my background is in uh, research in the clinical lab. This was me a little before I got diagnosed. <laughs> I look a little young there. Um, and my, my PCOS diagnosis was the defining moment in my life where I just knew I had to do something because it really didn't make sense to me that a disorder that's so prevalent, it impacts um, uh, in some parts of the world up to more than 20% of the female population or people assigned um, female at birth. And, uh, Yet it is so underrecognized and um, lacking in resources and information. So that's where PCOS Challenge was born. I'll skip through. Um, we're running a little short on time, um, but I wanted to cover um, really why this bill is so important and why every, really every state, every um, country, everyone should be supporting PCOS. Um, PCOS Challenge, we're the National Polycystic Ovary Syndrome Association. And um, our vision is that PCOS is treated as a public health priority, um, which is why legislative advocacy um, became such an important piece of our work. We've worked um, since 2017 in the US Congress to uh, address PCOS with. Um, with uh, resolutions that uh, federally designate September as PCOS Awareness Month. So we've worked with Massachusetts State Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren um, and uh, other co-sponsors included uh, US Senator Ed Markey um, to introduce the 
Senate resolution in the House, in the Senate, and in the House, we work with uh, Representative David Scott. He was actually the first person um, to introduce a PCOS resolution. He's um, my uh, representative in Georgia. And, um, and of course, there are other co-sponsors from Massachusetts. So uh, when we reached out to, to Rep Nika, she immediately said, of course, of course, I would, I'll do this. I'll, um, <laughs> and then learning about her connection to PCOS, I'm, it's not shocking. It's not surprising. Many of um, our supporters in the US Congress also have connections to PCOS. We hear about this all the time when, um, while doing our advocacy work. Um, and let me go back a, a little. So yeah, so Rep Nika, and um, we had 10 original uh, petitioners, but after today, I know we'll have um, plenty more people supporting the um, bill. And at the end, I'll have um, Rep Nika just kind of go back over the bill and, and share a little bit about how um, the designating September as PCOS Awareness Month in Massachusetts um, will help to uh, improve outcomes and lives of those impacted. So as you heard, um, PCOS has an impact um, on people's overall life. Um, their research from various parts of the world that show a connection between more likely to be hospitalized. Of course, 50% um, are going undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. 50% will become diabetic or pre-diabetic before age 40. So they're teenagers, um, people in their 20s who are um, have a disproportionate um, uh, likelihood of becoming diabetic or pre-diabetic. And we know that these are some of the biggest, most expensive burdens on healthcare. Um, the connection to endometrial cancer, especially in our um, Black women who are less likely to uh, be diagnosed with endometrial cancer until it's a little too late. So we'll get hysterectomies more often than others. Um, there are disparities within the disparity of PCOS, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, quickly becoming um, one of the leading causes of liver transplants. Um, and as uh, Dr. Maya Lingaya mentioned, um, the risks in pregnancy. So PCOS should be taken seriously. We usually at PCOS Challenge like to say that PCOS is the teal elephant in the room. We're addressing all of these other things, diabetes, um, cancer, maternal health, and PCOS is conspicuously absent from most of the conversations around this. And, and PCOS presents a unique opportunity to um, fend off some of these diseases or um, um, provide tools earlier in life to prevent them. So why is a PCOS Awareness Month so, um, you know, such a good idea in Massachusetts? Our goals with uh, this bill would be to increase PCOS awareness and education, encourage other um, localities to make PCOS a public health priority, um, ultimately improving um, access to, um, to uh, uh, things that can improve quali patient quality of life and outcomes. Uh, so this month, PCOS Awareness Month um, is this is our fourth year um, after um, kind of designating September federally as PCOS Awareness Month, uh, our fifth year, and our fourth year uh, declaring September 1st World PCOS Day. And we've seen exponential growth in awareness and awareness activities around PCOS simply from designating the month PCOS Awareness Month. So more people, industry, um, researchers, um, people in the medical community, they now have an opportunity to be more involved um, and um, help work together to find solutions. So seven ways you can help as legislators sign on to uh, support H3735 and the hearing and sharing evidence-based information and resources to your constituents. 
um, hosting a PCOS Awareness Month event. It's not too late. We're still in September and we can plan for 2022 and beyond because this movement is just going to continue to grow, right? And then work together um, with uh, nonprofits such as PCOS Challenge, such as Resolve New England, um, to provide resources for, um, for your constituents. I am Sasha Ati again, founder and executive director of PCOS Challenge. And we look forward to continue working together um, to provide resources and care for those with PCOS. <laughs> All right, and so next I have a little video, not a little video, it's really exciting <laughs> to show <laughs> um, from our, from Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren. PCOS affects between five and 10 million women. It is the most common endocrine disorder among women and a leading cause of infertility. We know how devastating it can be. Women with PCOS often suffer from psychological disorders like anxiety or depression or eating disorders. They also have a higher risk of developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Despite its prevalence and serious health effects, there is currently no cure for PCOS and many women and teens go undiagnosed for years. That is why, for the past three years, my Senate colleagues and I have led an effort to try to shine a light on PCOS by introducing a bipartisan resolution recognizing its seriousness and supporting the designation of September as PCOS Awareness Month. This month, I reintroduce this bipartisan resolution to help raise awareness about the need for further research, the need for improved treatment, and finally, the need for a cure so that women and teens can lead healthier, happier lives. But much more needs to be done. Every person suffering from PCOS needs support from their family, their friends, and their community. They also deserve the full support of their government. We need to increase education and research and ensure that there are robust resources to support the people and the families that are impacted by this disorder. I plan to continue this fight in the United States Senate. The work you do to advocate for people with PCOS is incredibly powerful. If we continue to come together and to make our voices heard, we can change the future for millions of people affected by PCOS. So again, thank you for all you do Thank you for being part of this fight. I'm with you all the way. Thank you so much um, to Senator Warren for continuing to, to help to, to raise the profile of PCOS. I'd like to introduce our next guest um, who is a PCOS patient. Her name is Megan Murphy. Um, well, thank you, Rep. Nika, uh, for having us here today and everyone here on the team. It's quite the uh, challenge and a little intimidating to come after uh, Senator <laughs> Warren on the agenda, but I am so excited to be here. Um, again, my name is Megan Murphy, and I was born and raised in Massachusetts. I grew up in Woburn, um, went to college at BU and lived and worked in Boston up until seven, seven years ago. Um, and I'm here today to share my story as a patient, those adolescent, teen, and into early adulthood years as a PCOS patient in Massachusetts were um, heartbreaking. And I really think we have an opportunity to make a change. Um, so despite access to care and a diagnosis at 18 years old, which is considered an early diagnosis um, from what I've understood from a lot of my peers, the treatment option I was always offered was hormonal contraception. Um, the, every time I took hormonal contraception, con contraception, it made me sicker than I already was and made me severely, severely depressed. Now, girls and women with PCOS are already seven times more likely 
to commit suicide than those who don't have it. These medications that don't work for so many of us and cause such harmful um, mental side effects, it, it, something needs to be done because we're losing girls and women to this. Throughout my teenage years and early adulthood, I shuffled from doctor to doctor. I feel like I've been to every office in the 617 area code and just trying to prove that I had PCOS. So oftentimes um, doctors have a, not all doctors, but many in my experience have an antiquated and very narrow view of what the PCOS patient looks like. And I guess I didn't fit that view. So I would often beg for blood tests and vaginal ultrasounds to say, no, I do have it. See, I do have it. Can you please help me? And each time this would happen, the doctors are always surprised at how um, the how strong the case was when they saw the numbers, when they saw the images. They're like, wow, you really do have PCOS. I'm like, yes, I know. Now, can you help me? And this went on for years. Um, so I was always told, um, go on the birth control pill. And when you're ready to have children, plan on seeing a specialist because it can, uh, PCOS can impact your fertility. There are things you can do for that, but you know, before that time, just take the pill, but I couldn't. So I remember walking out at 18, 19, 20 years old thinking, so I can't take this medication they're offering me and many others. And there's nothing else until if I choose to have children and reproduce later on in life, there's nothing in between. And it was just so disheartening. Um, one doctor in particular, I was waiting to see and I finally got to see him. He said that my symptoms were in my head and sent me to a psychiatrist. As I started my career, I lived in Boston and had even more access to doctors with my insurance. Um, however, things only worsened. I was put on different hormones, steroids, antibiotics, uh, anti-inflammatories, antidepressants to try to balance out all of the side effects from these drugs that what I know now that my body didn't need and it would just make PCOS worse. My body truly felt like it was falling apart. I always say that I was, you know, at the time 23, I felt like I was 75. It, it just nothing was adding up. Um, another specialist, offered me diabetes and blood pressure medication. And I said, but I'm not diabetic and my blood pressure is great. And she said, oh, well, it works for someone with PCOS. So maybe it will work for you. It didn't, I know that's not shocking, <laughs> but it didn't. This was a long, painful, as Consuela mentioned, expensive and damaging journey. And I wish my story was unique, but it's not. Um, something I want to mention today is eight years ago at the end of July, I was working at MassArt at the time and my niece, my, my brand new hours old niece was born at Brigham and Women's. So on my lunch break, I hustled over there and I held her in, in, for the first time and was filled with just the most intense love and joy for this little girl. And thinking, I, I just remember thinking, I would do anything for you. I would do anything for you. And as I was walking back to work, I was thinking about all the things I can't wait, wait to show her, things that she'll show me, um, what her life is like as a, as a girl being born at this time. And then I was just struck with the most just disappointment and sadness because I was thinking about my own adolescence and teen years. And I said, there's no way. I hope she never has PCOS. But the odds are high that somebody will. And if she doesn't have it, one of her friends will. And they, I just, they cannot go through what we've had to go through. Um, that frustration, it just, it was hard to, um, it was hard for me to understand as I was walking back to my office because I'm walking by Beth Israel. I'm walking by Boston Children's, um, Harvard Medical School. And of all of these places, some of the best places in the world, they can't figure out what's wrong with up to 10% of the female population in, in, in Massachusetts. I was heartbroken and disappointed that despite Massachusetts being a pillar of medical ingenu ingenu ingenuity, PCOS patients are being left in the dust. 
Um, I can't go back in time and give my 18, 19, 20 year old self the help that she needs. I wish I could, but what we can do is do things now to change it for current PCOS patients and future PCOS patients, because it's not going away anytime soon. We can only do so much on our own. And that's where we ask for your leadership and your support in the state of Massachusetts to grow awareness and educational programs, uh, medical training and research. I think Massachusetts has an amazing opportunity to be uh, to lead the country in PCOS research. And this creates jobs for young investigators and also gives health to, to hundreds of thousands of girls and women who may be the next person who can find the cure for PCOS. But when they're sick and they're falling behind in school and then you just, it trickles, they're not gonna have those opportunities. Um, over the years, when a friend or a community, uh, community member was sick, I'd often hear, well, if you're going to be sick, at least you're in Boston. It's a good, if you're gonna be sick, at least you're there. And that's true for so many illnesses, but it's definitely not true with PCOS. But I think we have an absolute incredible opportunity to change that. And I can't wait for that day to happen. So thank you again for your time today. And go Sox, as always. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Megan. Thanks for, I know, you know, we had a little talk before. I know it was, it's kind of hard to share some of these personal details of our lives. And, but connecting the dots is so important, connecting the dots between um, your experience with dealing with the disorder and how it um, impacts your school life, your career um, relationships is, is so important, overall quality of life. Thank you so much impacts for sharing. everything and impact starting at a young, young age. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, now we would like to share um, uh, our resident uh, PCOS nutritionist in Boston, um, Hillary Wright, um, whose accent never, never fades. You know where she is whenever you hear her talk. Um, and we, she is so knowledgeable and um, would like to share about nutrition and lifestyle for PCOS. Everyone, my name is Hillary Wright. I am a registered dietitian and I am the director of nutrition for the Domar Center for Mind Body Health at Boston IVF. Um, just a little bit from my background, I am a resident of Arlington, Massachusetts, um, have lived here my whole life, uh, graduate of the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and have a master's degree um, in health education from Boston University. I am also the author of the PCOS Diet Plan, um, which is, this is book is in its second edition and I first um, decided to write this book because I was a clinician seeing women with PCOS back in the early 2000s and there were just way too few resources to help women and other dietitians and clinicians understand the importance and the impact of this condition for which diet and lifestyle is the primary treatment. So for just a little bit of a background uh, on PCOS polycystic ovary syndrome, it's a strangely um, named condition because it makes it sound like the cysts cause the health problems when really the cysts are a manifestation of what's going on behind the curtain uh, health-wise in women with PCOS. And that is a unfortunately way too common condition called insulin resistance. So we know a lot about insulin resistance because it's most common manifestation that we're familiar with is type two diabetes which we know is exploding in our population. And in fact, the incidence of type two diabetes has increased 40% um, since the uh, early 2000s. So if you think of insulin resistance sort of as an umbrella condition that can manifest itself in many different ways, um, I, get, I like to actually start up by saying insulin resistance, it's important for us to understand, is a, such a common condition because it initially evolved to help people survive droughts and famine. So it's a genetic mismatch condition, something that used to be helpful in helping us preserve and hold on to our nutritional stores so we wouldn't um, starve to death during Johnson famines uh, because evolution is so slow, that same genetic tendency will actually uh, increase your risk of um, having obesity and diabetes um, and other conditions associated with insulin resistance that are also unfortunately exploding in our population and women with PCOS are at higher risk for. 
So those conditions include something called metabolic syndrome, which is a kind of a combined risk factors of diabetes and heart disease, um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is um, rapidly overtaking alcohol abuse as the primary cause of liver failure um, and need for transplant. Um, gestational diabetes, which carries many risk factors during pregnancy for both the mother and the developing baby. So because women with PCOS, upwards of 70 to 75% of them have some degree of insulin resistance prior to conception, they're higher risk for developing type two diabetes, excuse me, gestational diabetes, because pregnancy makes women insulin resistant. So if you already have that tendency and now you're pregnant, you are at higher risk of developing gestational diabetes, as well as other complications of pregnancy, like pregnancy induced hypertension, preeclampsia, very dangerous conditions in um, when pregnant women and uh, are also under this umbrella of insulin resistance. So in terms of statistics of diabetes, so again, I'm trying to drive home the point that this is a very expensive healthcare problem to ignore. Um, and not you know, fully embrace and work to prevent. So uh, it's estimated that 40%, uh, 50% of women with PCOS will be diabetic or uh, will have type two diabetes or prediabetes by the age of 40. So I see women all the time at Boston IVF. These are highly educated um, women who um, try to pack, practice healthy lifestyle uh, when they can, and they still have an increased risk of diabetes, and I do see type two diabetes in women in their 20s and their 30s with PCOS. So that is an awful long time to live with the health consequences of having diabetes. Uh, these women are much higher risk of developing high blood pressure, which is a major risk factor for heart attack and stroke. Um, from my perspective as a fertility nutritionist, um, PCOS is responsible to nine, for 90 to 95% of cases of infertility related to not ovulating. So it's an extremely expensive condition to treat because everyone knows that in vitro fertilization and other fertility treatments are a lot more expensive than natural conception and pregnancy. These women also need um, sometimes high risk OB monitoring, which again can get very costly. Um, there are also risks, as I already mentioned about gestational diabetes, pregnancy induced hypertension, et cetera, but there were also risks to the next generation. So we now understand that when um, women have obesity during pregnancy and they have what we call met metabolic problems, so blood sugars bumping up, um, high cholesterol, and so not all women with obesity have that, but many do. Um, and that we know, uh, we now believe actually increases the risk that their offspring, their children, will have obesity and diabetes and possibly even their grandchildren. So this is something that we really need to get on top of much earlier in life. Um, we need to spread the word among physicians who are often not recognizing this condition. Um, and we need to provide the kind of support these women need, which is knowledgeable physicians uh, familiar with PCOS, registered dietitians. Um, women with PCOS are very high risk for eating disorders. So uh, behavioral health therapy, um, you know, and we need open, non-judgmental care for this population because these women are often treated very skeptically by healthcare professionals because they're not familiar with the fact that insulin resistance can make it easier to gain weight and harder to lose. So I, uh, again, I apologize for not being there. Um, I hope uh, anyone who has more interest in learning about this condition would uh, be comfortable contacting me at Hillary with two L's at HillaryWright.com. Thank you. Hillary also gave a really comprehensive um, overview of PCOS and um, the need for access to nutrition, um, nutrition counseling and lifestyle counseling with PCOS. Um, so we're running a little short on time, but I would love to introduce uh, Delegate Price, uh, Delegate Marcia Price from Virginia to share her story and her connection to PCOS. Thank you so much for having me, Sasha. I am Delegate Sia Price. I represent the 95th District in Virginia. And I would just like to say ditto to everything that you've heard, especially from those that are speaking on behalf of those of us with PCOS. I'm like, yep. Got that? Yep, had that. Yep, went through that. Uh, so it is really interesting to be a legislator 
who also has it and is fighting for it. So I just tell you a little bit about my story very briefly. I was diagnosed when I was 16 and basically told, go lose weight and you'll never have kids. So you might wanna get used to that, um, but come back when you wanna try. So I literally spent the rest of my life talking myself out of wanting to have kids. And I don't know if you really fully understand the mental health impact that that has, but it was uh, tremendous. And so uh, there's that part. But then I was also like, if I stub my toe, uh, they're like, well, just go lose weight. It'll be better. <laughs> if I like, if I went into the doctor for anything, it was always lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. So the emphasis on the weight is what drove me to do some pretty crazy things in my early twenties that put my life at risk. And I just wish that someone had sat and, and had the information to share with me, especially I'm like trying to do an hour of cardio. That was actually counterproductive. I'm like starving myself, counterproductive. So the emphasis on weight is what kind of set me back. And I also had five doctors and guess what? None of them talked to each other. So they were giving me countering bits of information and it's just like, okay, this is not working. So from um, the mental health impact, the economic impact, what they said, I was trying all these different doctors and medicines and I was going, I, I feel like I was a guinea pig. It was like, well, let's try this combination. Well, let's try this combination. Co-pays, co-pays add up. But I did have insurance, so I know that puts me ahead of the game for quite a few people that are also going through this as well. Finally, when I reached 35, I got some providers uh, that knew what they were doing, knew what they were talking about, but had also told me it was probably a little late uh, for me to start a family, but I had already gotten used to that. I'm looking to foster and adopt later in life, but I think one of the other things as a legislator too that I want to uplift that I haven't really talked about a lot publicly, you know how like when you're elected, the people that helped elect you feel like they kind of own parts of your life, y'all the public will comment on my weight. And so my, my weight fluctuations, it's like, um, if, if my weight goes up, you know, someone will suggest that I go, you know, get a, more salads. Or if my weight goes down, it's like, great, you look beautiful. But I'm like, I was beautiful all through this whole process. Let's be clear. So it's, it's really intimidating as a legislator to go through this. So I never talked about it. And then just really quickly in 2017 is when a 16 year old constituent came to me and during office hours asking me if I could speak up for what she was going through. She had just been diagnosed with PCOS and I am sitting there with egg on my face. I could have been speaking up this whole time, but I was so ashamed. But the babies, the babies will lead us. She helped me get myself together and speak up about her experience, my experience, and we took it to the Virginia legislature. Now, my colleagues had to look me dead in the face while I was telling them about what it was going through because I have respect on both sides of the aisle and they respect me for the work that I do. So what I chose to do was tell them some of the things that I was going through and yet and still having to get the work done. And they respected me even more. And so those conversations were really key to helping people understand. Now, there were some legislators, as soon as I said uterus, I had their vote just to shut me up. <laughs> But we did want to bring awareness to the fact of what not just my lived experience, but how many women and people were going through this in Virginia. And it just really kind of opened their eyes. But I think the best part about it was um, when when we did it, it raised awareness amongst the legislators, but it also helped our constituents feel seen. I would be on break and in the grocery store and women coming up to me like, hey, I have it too. And we would sit there and just talk about it. And I'm like, hey, if you ever feel like coming up to Richmond to, you know, share your story or writing a letter, writing email, women writing emails to their legislators that had never spoken about this to even their families. And so it was empowering. But then also has been said to let them know that government was responding to their needs. And so uh, in, the, in the resolution that we had, we directed the Virginia Department of Health to put time and resources into awareness um, activities. They already said that they had the money in the budget, so it did not require an additional appropriation. We're gonna go back for more, but just
just letting you know that. But it really energized us for more. And it also let the providers know we are watching and we want you to be better. We want you to do better. So here, let us provide you with some tools for that. I think it was such an important step. It set, it set the stage for when I go back and ask for more. They already know what I'm talking about. They're already more aware about some of the constituent concerns. We're having roundtable discussions. Um, this Saturday, we're having a women's wellness event where we're going to highlight some of the things that I've just discussed. We've got new legislative ideas, funding priorities, and amplifying the lived experiences, and also a partnership with PCOS Challenge we'll be, where we'll be working together for more. So that's a little bit of the story here in Virginia. I'll stay on in case there are any questions, but thank you so much for um, allowing me to share this story. I know you all can do it. It just, just sign on, like just sign on. It's an amazing thing to be a part of. You will be helping raise awareness for, I mean, just the chronic pain, the, the mental health, just, I mean, brighten someone's day to just say, you know what? I hear you. I care. That's the bottom line. And that's what we're really elected to do. So thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Delegate Price. Thanks for your work. Thanks for your transparency. Um, thanks for all that you're doing for all of us with PCOS. And, um, you know, I, I, I commend you for you know, stepping up and sharing parts of you that were, you know, some historically embarrassing, right, for women. And so that empowers others, other girls, um, other women, other people who are going through the same thing to do the same and do the same for their loved ones. So thank you so much. And I hope, as you mentioned, um, that uh, the representatives on this call and in the Massachusetts state legislature will be in full support of this bill, um, H3735. Thank you. So um, now, Kate uh, LeBlanc from Resolve New England is going to join us and uh, and share a little bit before delegate um, before Representative El Aguardo, um comes back on. Thank you so much, Delegate Price. Thank you, Sasha, and thank you, Delegate Price. I hate going after Delegate Price, but I also love going after Delegate Price because, as I couldn't agree more with Rep. Mika, Delegate Price puts wind in our sails big time here in Massachusetts. So thank you so, so much. And I, I will be very brief because I want us to end close to on time. But the most important things I just want to say is that, and we're already seeing it in the chat with people who are already interested in signing on, is that I really want to say that just because a bill is not controversial, and this one really is not controversial, does not mean it is not important. This bill, as you've seen, and as you've just heard, it's made an impact in Virginia, and it will make an impact here to have an official PCOS Awareness Month in Massachusetts. That will make a difference. And so I just want to say, please sign on to H3735, support it throughout the legislative process. It hasn't had its hearing yet uh, in regulatory oversight, but it will. And so we really welcome your support. And now all of you that have been part of this today have more information, more knowledge, which is empowering about PCOS. Um, so I'll just end and pass it on to Rep. Nika just by saying that um, our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley uh, recently was on a call with me about a different issue, but she was talking about how early in her career she used to talk about being a voice for the voiceless. And she said that as her you know, life and career has evolved, she's changed it that she's not a voice for the voiceless. She's a voice for the unheard. And I love that. Um, and as you've heard today, there are strong voices and PCOS, I share what so many people have said today that something so common should not be so under-resourced, so under uh, misunderstood. Um, you shouldn't have the kind of gaslighting that you've heard about today, um, you know, it's like believe women and, and others with um, female bodies at birth, believe us the first time and make a change. So support 3735 and I will pass it to our lead sponsor and great friend, Rep Nika. So thank you. Resolve New England is very proud to be part of this with you, PCOS Challenge and everyone supporting this. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, Sasha, the indomitable Sasha, uh, who inspires us all. 
Thank you to the 30 some odd uh, legislative offices and partners that came on here and on Facebook Live. Uh, a special thanks to Delegate Price, uh, not only for what you shared today, but for who you are and the power of your leadership. I wanna thank the Dr. Mahaleen Gaya for your, for your sharing and Megan for sharing so passionately uh, and, and, and in ways that really hit home for a lot of us um, about your personal experience. Thank you, uh, Hillary Wright. And thank you for everyone who's joined on, especially, of course, I wanna thank my daughter. And I do wanna say, you know, 25, 30 offices. I know some of the staff are on Slack. I know colleagues were in conversations with our legislators all the time. Please hop on to your various channels and just shoot people a note for, for this bill. Tell them to sign on to it, H3735. We need some easy wins and this is an easy win. And if each of us just hits two or three folks, we'll have the whole legislature on board uh, before we know it. Uh, so thank you for your help. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your love. And thank you for your commitment to public health justice and to justice for women's health and for the health of all genders. We uh, are so appreciative to everyone and especially the PCOS challenge, the work you're doing nationally. Uh, and I hope to hear from many of you We'll be circulating for the folks that were here, the beautiful graphics that I'm only capable of because they're handed to me by Sasha and others. <laughs> and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have a big celebration this time next year, all in teal with teal ties for the folks uh, that prefer a tie over a blouse, uh, but we'll get it done. Oh, thank you so much, Repnika. Thanks for leading this in Massachusetts. We applaud you. We applaud your daughter, um, Consuela, for inspiring you. And um, thanks for everyone here for working with us in partnership to elevate the message around PCOS and why it needs to be a public health priority. Thanks, everyone. Feel free to reach out um, to us. You can connect with us at PCOS Challenge on social or um, email us info at pcoschallenge.org. And um, we'd love to connect and continue doing great work together. Thanks everyone for sharing and round of applause. <laughs>